And now I just want to add one more element to this discussion. Um, you'll also see this in the sources that I'm going to uh, include uh, with the link to the video. Um, the Rambam introduces into his discussion of prophecy with the, you know, the intellect, the, you, have to, the, the, you have to connect to the active intellect and the flow comes in and it flows forth to the imagination. Now, he introduces into the subject uh, another power or faculty, uh, in Hebrew, I, I don't know the Arabic, um, which is sometimes translated as divin divination, it's sometimes translated as intuition, um, and this power of divination, of intuition, mish'al, um, is, is variously interpreted. And I think, you know, these are, these are questions that are always open to inter inter interpretation. But you'll see the chapter in the sources on divination if you, if you choose to look there. And I think the Rambam in a couple of places purposely becomes extremely obscure and extremely dense and extremely hard to understand. Um, and uh, you know, and I admit again, I can't, I can't read the Arabic, but I've seen three different Hebrew translations, two or three different English translations, and they all become extremely obscure and extremely hard to understand. And I don't think you're meant really to understand it completely. Um, and I think there's good reason why you're not meant to understand it completely, because I think the Rambam wants to leave it a little open here. Um, again, I can't be sure. Um, but he seems to suggest, he says the following thing, he says sometimes a prophet is able to receive truth, intellectual truth, that was real philosophic divine truth, directly into the imagination. Because the intellect of that prophet isn't fast or strong enough to grasp it all. And then the prophet could produce visions, stories, parables, that contain divine truth, but that he himself doesn't understand. Because it didn't go through his intellect, it went right through his imagination. Now, that's an interesting idea. If it's true about, let's say, let's say Moshe Rabbeinu's power of divination. So, nobody has a greater intellect than Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, let's say what Rambam is saying is also true about Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, that's also a thing that's Maimonidean contradiction. Because he says, when he talks about the nature of prophecy and its mechanics, that none of it applies to Moshe Rabbeinu. But nonetheless, as he talks about it, he brings examples of verses relating to a particular prophet who is Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? He quotes things that relate to Moshe Rabbeinu, things that are clearly about Moshe Rabbeinu, things that what he did before Pharaoh, for instance. Right? But at the same time, he's not talking about Moshe. So you're never sure whether Moshe's prophecy is a totally different order, or even included in everything we're saying here about prophecy. But let's say for a minute we're talking about the power of divination of Moshe Rabbeinu. So that would mean that there were truths that Moshe's imagination received and then embedded in parables and stories. Um, now here I don't want to get into, there's a whole question about the role of imagination in Moshe's prophecy. Um, but for our purposes, let's, let's leave that outside and, and say, just, just we'll leave it like that. So there could be theoretically truths that could come directly into the, in, the, the imagination through this power of divination, right? So then how could you say, how could there be a truth that Moshe Rabbeinu's intellect couldn't perceive? Well, if there's a truth that Moshe Rabbeinu's intellect couldn't perceive, then no human intellect could perceive it. And if I say this, then I'm saying that there are divine truths that can enter directly into the imagination and produce parables and all the kinds of stories that we find in the Bible that no human being can understand their intellectual content. That's another way of, if, if I really say that, and the Ramam does not say that explicitly, I think you could push what he says in that direction. He doesn't go too far with it, and I think there's a good reason he doesn't go too far with it. And this is the reason. Because if you go too far with that position, then you end up upsetting the basic hierarchy of intellect and imagination not as faculties, but in terms of the content of prophecy that's left over. Because that would suggest that there are divine truths to be found in the stories of the Bible that have no philosophic counterpart that any human being could ever, ever understand. So if the hierarchy was intellect is the truth and imagination is just the medium, right? If there are things in the medium which are divine and which no human intellect could understand, then the stuff 
of the, the Bible, the stuff of, that produced by imagination, the stuff of visions and stories and parables, um, that itself could have truths that no human philosophy could express. And that is getting very close to a position which would say that prophecy is its own truth and it's not dependent on philosophy. And I think for that reason Rambam doesn't go in that direction. But he does sort of open a door in that direction, right, by saying there's this power of divination and by sort of leaving it open exactly how it works and suggesting there can be truths that get into the content of the prophets, uh, the, you know, the actual prophecy, the literary result of their prophecy, the books that we have, there could be truths that could get into there and be real divine truths, and yet the prophet himself wouldn't understand them, even though he was a philosopher, because he wasn't a great enough philosopher. That it, that the, the more, the more I allow that for a possibility, in other words, Rambam, I think, leaves the question open, is there such a back door? If I walk over to that back door, open it, and walk out 100 meters, I'm in the kuzari. I've left the guys are perplexed. In other words, the fact that the Rambam recognizes the possibility of such a back door is I think because he's such a complex, sophisticated thinker that he's aware of the limitations of his own approach. But that doesn't mean that he wants to follow those limitations to their rational conclusion, because their rational conclusion might be a non-rational form of religion where I see prophecy as a truth in and of itself, and I don't seek to know what its universal, rational, intellectual underpinning is. I don't ask about every story, what's its philosophic meaning, because it might be divine truth and yet have no philosophic meaning that any human being can understand. Um, so I think it's a very interesting aspect of his idea of prophecy. But in general, he doesn't want to go in that direction. Um, and he doesn't want to go in that direction because he wants to maintain the whole rational, intellectual, scientific, philosophic edifice that he's established. Um, but it reminds us a little bit of negative theology, which opens up all sorts of questions. Because once negative theology undermines the absolute nature of the philosophic system, then you can always ask, well, wait a minute. If, the, if scientists don't really know, if philosophy doesn't really know, then maybe the, the traditional formulations, which don't sound philosophic or rational, maybe they have some truth to them. And how could I know? Because philosophy doesn't go all the way. Um, and again, he opens that door, but he doesn't go that too far that way because that would undermine his orientation as a whole. Um, okay, so I, was, uh, I hope I addressed some of the questions um, uh, that you raised about prophecy. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to this video together with some links to some other material. Leave it and be well.